Rosario is an award-winning ceramic artist from Acoma Pueblo, New Mexico. She creates stunning pottery forms with black, white, and occasionally polychrome designs using natural clays and paints. Lusario learned her craft from her mother, Rebecca Lusario, who is also a ceramic artist, as well as from her extended family. She feels it is her job as an artist to preserve the traditions of the past. Lusario won a first place ribbon for a miniature plate in 2012 at the Santa Fe Indian Market and has also participated in the Heard Museum Indian Fair and Market. She's a museum curator assistant at the Sky City Cultural Center and Haku Museum in Acoma Pueblo. Take it away, Amanda. Amanda, you're muted. Yeah, hi everyone. Hope you're all having a good afternoon. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, again, my name is Ananda Vicario. I'm from the Pueblo of Acaba. Um, my clans are Big Yellow Corn and Little Bear. And as I mentioned, I do do the pottery. I did learn from my mother and my aunt. They're the ones that actually taught me the process. Um, I really wasn't too really into it as a teenager. I really didn't have an interest, but my mother kept, you know, kept on me and I'm glad she did because now I really enjoy it. Um, I'm actually working on a piece. So when I'm not working, I'm painting. So this is actually a raw piece that's, um, that I'm working on. So hopefully finish it soon. So as you can see, the smooth, shiny finish there, it's a slip that we put on there. Uh, so everything that I use is a natural, a natural paint, a natural material. There are no commercial products that are used, no paints. Um, the only commercial thing I use is I do paint with a brush. I cannot for the life of me use the yucca. <laughs> My mom can, but I, I cannot, it does not work for me. So I use a brush and I use the very tip of the brush to get my lines like that. That's what I use. Um, I do have other tools that I use. I use a, um, a pencil here. So when I'm gonna start like anything on a pot, it's just all freehand. So I don't really use anything other than eyeball it here. So I just kind of, you know, draw lines here, try to figure out the middle of a piece. And from there, you know, you can't really see it, but there's lines and I try to find my center. I don't worry about the pencil because they're in a fire and it, it all burns off. So I just kind of use it as a guide. And then from there, I just freehand paint. <laughs> Um, the clay is actually a, it's this color when it's mixed, so it's like a dark gray. This one's actually kind of dry because I haven't been making it, it's been working a lot. So I really haven't done much with the pottery. So that's how it looks when it's processed. Um, we do mine our own clay. Uh, it's actually very rare that anybody really does do all of the traditional anymore. It's very hard and tedious work. It, sometimes I can get frustrating, you know, sometimes I cry because it don't, <laughs> they don't come out right, you know, and the you know, clay is actually like a slate form when we mine it. So it comes out in like big chunks and it's like really gray and uh, once you put it in water, you soak it like two or three times to get out all the debris, like the roots and dirt and stuff. And then from there, we can go ahead and mix it. And when it's dry, I was actually um, scraping. So these are little scrapings from a piece that I did. So it dries like a light, a light gray color. But um, yeah, all the clay is natural, we mine it and we process it ourselves. Uh, the paint that we use is this here. I don't want to tilt it too much because it'll spill. It's like a light reddish color, brownish. 
this paint is actually a natural paint as well. So, so yeah, it's, it, it can dry in its powdered form. So you can mix a lot and dry it. And if you need some more, you can just put it in there. I myself have to do that because I don't live on the Pueblo currently. I do reside in Albuquerque. So it's hard for me to get the resources. So um, when I do go home and visit my mom usually, helps me get my stuff together so I can make and paint down here. It's a bit of a challenge and it's not the same as painting at home, but you know, I, I still do do it. And the rock from the paint is actually an iron oxide rock. So what we do is we have a larger rock and we use the smaller rocks that we find from the wash, like in the mountains where the river runs down and stuff. All that debris that comes down from the mesas there in the hills, we go after a storm a few days later and walk through the arroyo there and we get the paint rock. So that's where that comes from. <clears throat> and then we do add, um, it's a beeweed plant. It's a seasonal plant that grows within the valley of Akamon that we get. It's almost like a wild spinach. It is edible. You know, you just have to really cook it. But we get the sap from that and you dry it and it gets really sticky. And we add it to our paint. And what that does is it's more of a like a binder it, so the paint don't rub off. Um, we can also use um, beet juice. You know, go to the store, buy beet to boil the beef. To eat the beets and then we keep the juice and you can add it to the paint as well and it turns it like a darker color as well. Um, the paint, the orange paint that we use is a natural paint as well. This is one of them. So this one actually fires a darker orange than what it is here. And this one is actually a dark almost like a maroon like a red color when it fires so that's the cool thing i like about you know working with natural things you never know what's going to happen so this one it is like a beige but when we fire it it turns like a red color and then, like i said this is the white slip that we use i don't use a brush i use a little rag hair i wet it and dip it in here and then i apply it to my pieces here and it and then from there, I um, take a stone like this. This is a smooth, regular stone. And you put it here and you polish. And what that does is it makes a smooth, shiny finish like you see there. And then from there, you're ready to paint. So that's another tool I use with the rock because there's the same rock there. Um, Majority of the tools that I do use are, this is actually a coconut shell. So um, I use this, especially on the larger pieces if I'm making jars or vases, it's easier to go in there and you put your hand inside the pot and you push the clay up against. And so you're shaping the pot actually to the form of your hand. However, if you hold your hand and push the clay, it's gonna shape it. This is one cool tool I love, it's a coconut. This one is actually um, one of my daughter's toys. <laughs> it's a plastic cookie. <laughs> She's uh, three, so she didn't miss it, but this is what I use too. Um, let's see, another coconut shell. And this one is a wooden shell, a uh, wooden tool that I use. I use mainly use this one to um, kind of pat the pottery in if there's like a, an even side of it. You can go ahead and tap it with this and it'll shape it. Um, let's see. And then, of course, I just use a little knife thing here to cut the top of the pot to make it even. And this is my favorite, favorite tool. It is a good old Copenhagen tobacco chewing lid. So, this is what I use to scrape the access off the pottery. So, that's one step. I'll go and I'll scrape it while it's wet, and this actually helps pull the clay off. Well, this is my favorite. <laughs> I love this tool. Uh, that's mainly what I work with. Um, and then the other process, and this is actually a lava rock. Oh, I'm falling off it. This is a lava rock that we use. 
So this one is actually, you can see it's really smooth on one side here. So what I do is I dip this in water and when the pot is still wet, I'll go and I'll rub it over the pot like so. And what this does is it helps push in, you know, all the pigments that are in there. And then from there, I'll take this rock again, wet it and go over the pot again to push in all of the, make a smooth finish. Then I'll just dip my fingers in water and run it over the pot and get a smooth finish. And then you have to let them dry. And from there, you paint. And painting is the last step. I do get a lot of people that ask me if I use stencils or if I, um, I think the most interesting one I've had was at, at a show, um, a gentleman asked me if I um, did printables, like, uh, like you know, the, those plastic things you put on the Easter eggs and you put them in warm water and they stick to the egg. He thought I, that's what I did. I was like, buddy, I wish if I did, I'd have a mass production. <laughs> You know, but um, it, it is a lot of work. It's very time consuming. It can get stressful. Uh, you never know what's going to happen with the pot. Sometimes just a little air bubble in the, in the clay, if you don't need the clay right, a little tiny air bubble will cause a disaster. It will blow the pot to pieces. Or if you don't put a hole all the way through the seat pot, the whole thing will burst. If there's an oh, air pocket in the bases or jars, I trust me, I've had my experience with those. And it's just heartbreaking because you put your all into it and in the end it just it breaks. So, but none of it's wasted. We can we crush them back up and we add that to our clay. So it's just like everything just gets reused. We don't waste anything. Um, other than that, it's like I said, everything is natural. Um, I'm very fortunate to come from a very well-known family of potters. You know, um, my mother, Rebecca Lacario, I give her, you know, a lot of credit for encouraging me and helping me and showing me and teaching me. I do have an older brother named Daniel Lacario who does pottery as well. Um, my aunts, Marilyn Ray, um, Carolyn Concho, Diane Lewis Garcia. Judy Lewis, you know, they all do pottery as well. So I'm very fortunate that I have all of them to look up to. And I'm just hoping that, you know, my child continues this tradition because, like I said, not a lot of people from Akuma really do do the traditional. And I'm glad that they are taking interest again. You know, that was part of um, a project that I did with the Sky City Culture Center and Hapa Museum being the um, museum curator assistant, what we did was we got a grant and from that grant, we were able to do uh, traditional pottery making classes. So we got, you know, went through the Pueblo, used our resources, found individuals that do still do the traditional pottery making. We um, were able to have them come in and teach the, kid, the kids. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it was nice. We had a youth, class strictly for children from ages, I think it was eight to 18. And then we had an adult class from 19 to however old. And I was really pleased, you know, with the outcomes that we had, seeing how many people were actually, you know, willing to want to learn, you know, and so with me, you know, I don't hide anything in my process. You want to see me make, hey, I'll show you. You want to see me paint, I'll show you. You know, I, I don't, like I said, use anything out of the ordinary, everything I use, I show. I actually am very fortunate. Um, my talent has actually landed me to, I've actually participated in the uh, Idol Jordan Museum in the market in Indianapolis. I think that was in 2019, where I did win uh, first place for the pottery division. And then I've been to um, the Herd Museum, of course, Swaya in the market, and the Idol Jor. Oh, and then the one in, um, which one is it called? I actually just got an email from her. Uh, I can't recall, but there's another show that I did. Oh, and then the Smithsonian. I actually did the Smithsonian 
Art and Craft Show in December. I've been there twice. My mother's been once. And then I did the Smithsonian Women's Committee back in April, I believe it was. So uh, like I said, this talent and everything my mother has passed out to me has been very blessed for me. And I'm thankful that I, I, I did learn. And one day I hope that my daughter will learn. You know, I have a four-year-old and I hope that she continues on this tradition because it's very important to me. You know, and so yeah, so that's all I have for you. I don't know, I don't know what else to describe or anything, but that's the process I use. And then the only other thing I use is I do use um, bottled water, distilled water for my paints, um, mainly for the black paint. Uh, for my color paints, the colors that I use, I do use uh, rainwater. It, for some reason, it makes the paint brighter. It's pretty cool. And then the designs, uh, the colors, black always represents the clouds. And um, you got the lines. Every time you see lines on a pot, that represents rain. And this particular pattern here that I did is referred to as the snowflake pattern. If you look up uh, myself or my mother, you'll see we do a lot of this type of work. There is another form of <clears throat> one that we do, it's called like referred to as a cornfield pattern. You know, um, the centers, however the lines are, like on the pot here, uh, this, this particular one represents the North Star. And then you have cornfield pattern here. So this will represent a North Star for guidance. And then you got your cornfields in there, your snowflake pattern, and then you got your lines on size for rain. Like I said, the black always means clouds. The orange color always represents the sun. <clears throat> the red, reddish color that you do see in some of the pieces uh, represents Mother Earth. Uh, green, I believe, is for longevity. I don't, I'm not really too familiar with the rest of the colors. I know we do have them. There is like a purple or lavender color. That's actually a pretty color. Um, it's from a sandstone as well. Most of these paints are from sandstone. So we just break them down, soak them, and re-soak it, and then we use a cloth. So, uh, just a simple cloth like this, and you put the, the wet soak in there, and then you just squeeze it and strain it, and we get the paint out of there. So that's how we do it. <laughs> um, other than that, like I said, I really personally don't really work with colors. It's just really time-consuming because you have to make sure that you get every little corner. If not, you will definitely see a white spot on there for it not being the same um, consistency on the pot. Um, and then you have to go and realign the pot. And, you know, it, it's just really more time consuming. And, you know, a lot of people kind of like mind boggle them. They're like, well, why is your piece so expensive versus, you know, something? And so, you know, that's why I say, well, it, it's a lot of man hours. <laughs> if, you know, I've thought and asked how many times, uh, how many hours I take or how many, how long it takes, that I, I really don't know because I don't just sit there eight hours a day and paint, you know, I, that's impossible. I, you know, I work on two or three pieces at a time just to kind of, you know, give my eyes a break. Um, Right now, like I said, I really haven't been working on pottery, so I'll probably get back to it pretty soon here. Other than that, um, yeah, that's it. So thank you for your time and thank you for watching and you all stay safe and have a very blessed day, okay? Thank you. Great, thanks, Amanda. I think we'll have uh, time for some questions and answers uh, after Joe's presentation and we can all uh, um, ask those questions. So. It's my honor now to be here to welcome, introduce our, and introduce our next artist, Joe Bussell. Um, I've known Joe, and I'm, I'm scared to say this, Joe, I've, I've known Joe for 20, 20 plus years. Um, in fact, he and I were both hired as adjuncts at uh, JCCC in 2001. Uh, so we worked side by side for a little bit. I mean, we were both like 12 or so when we were hired. Is that so. right, Joe? I think that's yeah. right. 
<laughs> um, since that time, our paths have, have repeatedly crossed um, as Joe and his artist husband, Fred, are, are, are and have been fixtures in the Kansas City art scene. Uh, Joe received his uh, a BFA in, in painting uh, from, from the University of Kansas, and he holds two MFAs uh, from Washington University in St. Louis, one in painting and the other in ceramics. Uh, Joe has, has lived and worked in Boston, LA, Tucson, Omaha, St. Louis, London, and Kansas City. He has maintained his practice for close to 50, 50 years, and his works have been ex exhibited widely, regionally, uh, nationally, and internationally. Um, I was fortunate enough yesterday to get to go to the Nerman Museum and visit uh, Joe's new show, uh, Frags, um, which beautifully connect uh, the, the world of his paintings with the realm of sculpture and installation to construct a rich and personal narrative. Um, it was a fantastic experience, and I'm, I'm hoping that everybody that's listening now will get to go uh, sometime soon to interact with this this show and get a chance to to, to visit it. So, everybody, welcome me uh, or join me in welcoming Joe Bussell. Thank you, Mark. I need to share my screen. Yeah, there we go. This. There we go. And play. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and, and thank you, Mark. That was a very generous uh, introduction. And thank you, Catherine, for all of your, your help and all of this. Um, like Mark said, I've kept a, a, an art practice for uh, 50 years. And um, I just want to give you a uh, personal art history that led to the frag installation here at the Nerman Museum of uh, Contemporary Art. Um, I'm going to start you off uh, in uh, 1985 to 1990. Um, I worked in an AIDS hospice, and um, the art I made during this time was a snapshot of the resident's end of life journey. Um, I titled this work uh, The Apartment Series, and it was exhibited in uh, solo shows. It, it was exhibited in uh, solo shows uh, at the Thai Gallery in New York City. The executive director was Gifford Booth. Uh, these gouache paintings belong to a large body of work I made over, uh, over these years. Um, I also exhibited this work at various college and university galleries, art centers, including a solo show at KCAC. Uh, this was during uh, executive director Janet Simpson's leadership. The work was also featured in uh, the magazine US News and World Report. Um, this article was one of the first to document artists' response to the AIDS pandemic. I want to note here, um, my experiences at the hospice are, are embedded in my thoughts and consequently inhabit some portion of the work I make today. In the 90s, I lived in St. Louis where I spent, where I went to graduate school and taught art. Um, the work I made during this time turned my ideas about art making on its head. I embarked on this new journey and embraced my newfound post post modernist queer abstract language with an open mind and a full heart. In 1997, that was the year I landed an opportunity to live and work in London. I call this my incredible artist residency. Even though London was my home base, I traveled and explored throughout Europe and Northern Africa while making art. And um, these are some examples of the work I was making at that time. Um, they're oil on large prime Stonehenge paper. Uh, they're inspired um, by the time um, I spent in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. The death of my parents brought me back to Kansas City. In uh, 2001, I set up a studio and taught ceramics at Johnson County Community College. 
At this time, I began the frag series. These stack sculptures are cast, molded, and sealed hunks of paint that I collected from the Johnson County household hazardous waste site. I exhibited this work at the Margie Gallery and the Contemporary Art Space in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Bingham Gallery at the University of Missouri, the Mark Chapman Gallery at Kansas State University, Plug Projects, the Inner Urban Art House, and the Lady Volkos Art Center. Two thousand ten marked the twenty fifth anniversary of my time working at the AIDS hospice. In honor of those that died, I began a new series of paintings titled Silver. The series was featured in the art journal New American Paintings. These works are acrylic on canvas. Uh, the works in this body range in size from eleven inches by fourteen inches to six foot by seven foot. Thanks to my friend, the amazing artist Suzanne Kessler and uh, gallerist Ermelo Heimbacher, this work was exhibited in a solo show at Galleria Monti in Rome and Contemporary Art Festival in Campo Basso, Italy. Images of the work were also included in the Italian edition of the book Autumn Contamination. Back in Kansas City, um, I, was at, I was a first time Charlotte Street Foundation grant finalist and invited to exhibit in the Kansas City collection. This work was also shown at Penny Theamy's very special creation, Vala. Bruce Hartman selected work from this series for his exhibition, Abstraction, Kansas City. He later added some of my paintings to the collection. In addition to this, my work was selected for the Charlotte Street uh, Art Board program. The location of this is in Kansas City on Southwest Boulevard in the, in the Crossroads Arts District. My work was selected for this program again, program again uh, last summer. The original works are acrylic on canvas, 36 by 48. Several years ago, I ran into Bruce at an art exhibition. During the conversation, he said he wanted to show the frag sculpture. I told him I didn't have many pieces of that series left. The work had either been sold or had been cannibalized. Of course, I wasn't gonna let any opportunity like that slip away from me. So I told Bruce I would start working on some new pieces. And if I found my way back into the work, I would send him images. A few months later, Bruce greenlit the project. As I was making the work, I began thinking about the wall color of the gallery. These are images by uh, Fred Trees. I went from green to black, to cobalt, cobalt blue, to bluish white, but kept coming back to violet. I had a mock-up built in my studio so I could get an idea of the overall effect the color would have on my sculptures. Violet was obviously a bold choice. And I wanted to see how the sculptures stood up in all that purple haze. Bruce and I met again at, Queer Abs at the Queer Abstraction Show, November, 2019. During our conversation, I suggested asking Barbara O'Brien to write the essay for the FRAG exhibition. In case you don't know, Barbara is currently an independent art, art, art curator, critic, and consultant from Milwaukee, and was the former executive director of the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City. Bruce was delighted at the prospect of having Barbara on, on board. When I asked Barbara, she was delighted as well. So we have three delighted people. What could go wrong? We synchronized our calendars for early March, 2020. Barbara flew to Kansas City so she could sit with my work and we could talk. Bruce came to the studio on the third day to finalize things. Barbara flew home and a few hours later, COVID roared and shut everything down. 
The following month, Barbara finished the essay for the FRAG exhibit. I'll share some excerpts. Barbara's essay is titled Solid, Liquid, and In Between. This is a quote. We stand under the hulking form of COVID-19, a terror so large, and newly present, that we cannot yet identify the size and shape of a shadow. Bussell uses fragments of his own history to interpret our time and place, our culture and challenges. Barbara continues, each frag disguises its reincarnation as layered concrete, stone and plaster. Well, what we are looking at is an object formed from layers of acrylic house paint. The, the objects embedded in these layers of paint are often plastic ones, upcycled up from a secondhand store or found in dumpsters. Barbara concludes, for all the complexities of the frag series, there is also humor and joy. I need to note the first image you saw and the following images are by E.G. Schemp. Last month, my husband Fred and I came to the museum to install the work. Once I walked into the violet colored gallery, it was clear to me, those were not just 22 sculptures laid out on brick tables. This was a complete installation that was all at once a raucous pride parade, a New Orleans jazz style funeral march, and maybe most, of, most important of all, it was a healing balm. The multi-layered resonance of this work was a surprise to me. And being surprised is the ultimate outcome I can expect from art. The frag installation is in the McCaffrey Gallery and will be on exhibit through December 22nd. Thanks again to everyone that attended today and a special thank you to Bruce Hartman and everyone for making all of this possible. <laughs> Did I leave time for questions, Mark? <laughs> So we do have time for questions. Okay, good. Yeah, so there's one in the Q&A um, for Amanda. So someone wrote, your work is incredible. Is it available anywhere besides Acoma and the Santa Fe Indian Art Market? So I do do a lot of business with um, Andrea Fisher Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, the two gray hills gallery in Utah. Uh, Scott does, I do a lot of business with him as well. And, you know, if anything, if you ever want a custom piece, you're more than welcome to contact me myself. And I do ship out when I do do special orders like that. And, yeah. and, and Joe, there was a question for you. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to add to the question a little bit too. The, the question is asking, what is the inspiration for starting one of your sculptures? And then I, I would, like you to elaborate a little bit more on how you start there. I mean, what, 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 what is the inspiration and then how do you start a sculpture? Um, I surround myself with a lot of material uh, and it's just going through and sort of mining what is going to work. And oftentimes it's two very disparate things. So, um, but that's where I start. I mean, I, I'll start joining things and it may be, you know, by the end of the day, I may just have a table full of things that are just this incongruous shapes and colors and uh, materials that really don't make sense. And, at, and as the time goes by, I start um, joining them. Um, if uh, you have, if you want to know more, I can tell you, but uh, that, I, that's, that's really the basic basis of it. So do, do, do you think that the inspiration kind of comes at the same time, I mean, I mean, you're just you're just inspired by the objects that are there, and then you just assemble and and they start. And I know this sounds really hokey, but they really do. They just start talking to me, and I know 
what colors are starting to work and what shapes are starting to work. And then there's just a real foundation, a real foundation with all of that. Excellent. So Amanda, um, I have a couple for you. So someone was wondering how long a piece typically takes and if you work on more than one at a time. I remember you saying you work on several at a time and it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, so I do try to work on several at a time because um, some of the designs are really interested and then so I try to do like different signs at once just to kind of readjust my eyes. Especially if I'm doing um, the fine line detail in there, I have to like really steady my hand. So I'll work on a, a larger piece with the design bigger to steady my hand. Then I'll go to the smaller pieces and then I'll be able to do fine lines from there. But I do work on more than one piece at a time. So usually I can finish, if they're tiny, small pieces, I can finish like two or three in a day. That's not anything. But if I'm working on large pieces, it does take me quite a while. It takes me anywhere from three weeks to four weeks start to finish because I do make a lot of mistakes. And so I go back and I try to um, get out as many as broken mistakes as I can. I can use uh, the tip of a yucca, the, you know, they're really pointed. I'll use that or a, a metal scraper tip and you can go in there and lightly um, remove the mistakes from the piece there before it's fired. Once it's fired, you can't. So that's what's more time consuming as well. Joe, we have a question asking about your, uh, the relationship between your paintings and the sculptures. Uh, can you maybe address how, how they work together? Do they influence each other? Do they change each other? Do you go back and forth at the same time? Or do you go back and forth a lot? Um, and I do think that there are some really fundamental um, things throughout my throughout my 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 career. I mean, uh, even when I go back to the apartment series paintings, even though they're uh, figurative. Um, I think there's a color palette that 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 I uh, gravitate toward rather naturally. Um, I think I undid that a lot when I was in graduate school. Um, I really discovered uh, I kind of eliminated a lot of things in graduate school, which was kind of interesting. But um, once I started working um, in uh, ceramics again, like in two thousand one. Um, color, color came back with a vengeance, and um, you know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of think that you need to listen to your voice and find a way to, to express that. Um, and painting, you can kind of see. I mean, some of the shapes are similar, um, and I think some of the application is is similar. Even, I mean, the the sculpture has a very painterly uh, feel to it. And, um, but, um, but anyway, yes, I do think that they, I, I think they fit together in a, in a, um, in an interesting way. Uh, they're not, uh, I think the painting may be a little more refined, if we're going to use that word. <laughs> I don't usually ever use that word, but uh, the, uh, the sculpture, uh, I think it allows me to open up and, and really find another way to, to, uh, get to the heart of what I'm trying to say. You know, I, I don't, I actually, I don't want to have a fight here, but I might argue with you. I, I think the sculptures have a certain amount of refinement just because of their physicality. There, there, there's a, and it just depends on how you, you use the word refinement. Do you find yourself making a sculpture and then going, wow, then you need to make a painting of that sculpture? Or is that, is that, oh, no, not, no, that doesn't work that no, way? No, that never or, happens. Or do you make a painting and say, well, that would look great in, in three-dimensional form? No, okay. no, I don't really do that either. But, very, but, very, but one thing I do do a lot with the sculpture that I don't do with painting is that I have a tendency to tear things apart and, and figure out another way to put that together. Um, painting, uh, especially uh, painting in the last, I don't know, 20 years, it has become very um, kind of a one-shot deal. I don't, I don't rework, I don't rework things. If it's not working, I just, start something new. Um, life is too short. <laughs> and uh, so I, and I don't like that, that whole thing. I taught enough when I'd have students that would get frustrated and I was just like, oh my gosh, 
you just need to start over. And then they'd get this look like, oh my God, I cannot start over. It's like, yeah, you do. You need to start over. I hope my, my students heard that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I tell them that all the time. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's good. Tara, you want to ask the next one? Sure. Yeah, here's a great question. Um, it says, Pebble pottery is synonymous with New Mexico. Other than decoration, is the pottery used for any other purposes? And so, yeah, the, the jars that we make, the large jars that we do make, uh, we still use them in our traditional ceremonies. Uh, they're actually used for carrying water. And the cool thing about that is you can put like lukewarm water in there, give it about 20, 30 minutes, and it Play the form of the pot, it turns the water cool. And it tastes like the smell of wet dirt is the taste you get from that water. So we still use a lot of those pots uh, during our traditional ceremonies. But um, other than that, the seed pots right now, they're just a more modern version of what the men used to use a long time ago. So the holes, of course, were a lot bigger and they use corn cobs to put um, in the hole to store seeds. So during planting season, the men would go through kind of like a salt shaker in the field and you get the seeds out and plant and then break the pot. Because in our culture, when we break a pottery, um, it signifies like we're calling the rain. We're going to make it rain so the crops can grow. So that's kind of like what their purpose is, that purpose is for. And then we do have a type of pottery that's called a water jug. It's what the men would use a long time ago. They have little um, handles on the side. Again, they would use a corn cob to cork it shut and they would store their water in there. That's what they're used for. And then we do have the other pots that we use. They're all orange. Uh, those are bean pots and we use those mainly to, um, we can store the, uh, the, what is it, the parched corn is what we do. We throw the dirt in there with the corn and cook it. And so, yeah, that's what a lot of them are used for still today. Um, there, there was a, a several questions here. Um, this one, this one maybe go, goes out to both artists. Can you can you elaborate on how the idea of failure um, figures into your into your work? And I think Joe, you were touching on this a little bit, but but um, how do you approach the idea of failing, and how how does that infl in, come out in the work? Amanda, you can take that. Hard <laughs> 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 night. Okay. Oh, no, I, um... <laughs> I'm, I'm really hard on myself uh, when I do do my art. It, like, I have to have it perfect. And, you know, I do get like people like, oh, this is so perfect. How do you get it perfect? And I'm like, no, it's not. I'm standing here and I can see that little mistake that I missed. But I always try to do my best, but it, it's just, when I paint, I clear my mind and whatever I feel is what I paint. You know, it, I don't try not to, like for me, failure is just not an option. I just do my best, you know, I'm always doing my best. And if that's my best, then that's how far as I push myself, I'm always learning to improve. But other than that, I don't let it, let that word really get to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta go check on my daughter really quickly. Yeah, Joe, Joe, do you wanna take a stab at uh, that? Sure, uh, you know, I think failure, you can learn a lot. By failing. And um, I think, you know, that's something that, and also it, it's oddly freeing if you fail miserably and it just, you know, I don't know. I just think you can learn a lot from failing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not, it's not a scary thing. I, uh, at least not for me. I just, uh, um, I don't like to fail, but it happens. And yeah. Is this, do you accept that? Um, Joe, can you talk a little bit about how personal meaning evolves out of the formal arrangement of your objects? How, how, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think the language is something that oftentimes is just cultivated over years of making. And some, it's funny, Barbara and I had a kind of, off the record conversation about, about this. And, and I do think that there is a time when an artist will start working instinctually. And, um, and maybe some artists work that way 
all the time. I think, uh, but I think an older artist sort of learns how to tap in to that if they're if they're paying attention. And um, so, yeah, I think uh, I think intuition plays a part too, which I think that's just a really crazy thing to say, but there is something that, that happens. And, and also don't take this making part so, too terribly serious. I mean, got to take it seriously, but at the same time, if it's not working, tear it apart, move it around, you know, just have the freedom to, to do all of those things that, that, you know, artists, uh, I, I think sometimes they're, they're, they're scared to do that. And I think a lot of artists will get a, uh, their, you know, get their um, um, story and their, their thing and they get in their head and it's sort of like, you know, be, be open to changing things up. And, you know, that may be a route that you've been wanting to go down for, you know, a long time and just never took the, the, the courage never took the courage to, to go there. But anyway, I digress. There was a, a question earlier that uh, I'm going to go back to about uh, um, the, about the pieces in the, in the Nerman show that, that you, but you have 20, 21, 22 pieces 22. Mm -hmm. in the exhibition. Uh, the question I was asking if, if they're considered um, just one big installation or are they individual pieces? I mean, I, I will say when I was there that the, most fun and exciting thing, the most surprising thing was how they talk to each other and how they went back and forth. And so I, I, I do think in the grouping, they, they, re, they read maybe differently than they would individually, but I, how about, how would, how would you answer that? Yes. And that was, a, that was, like I said, in, in the end, I mean, that, that was the surprise to me uh, because I, you know, I, I, I had plenty of space to work. And so I was spreading things out a lot. And this is really the first time, well, I guess when Barbara came to visit, I was putting things back together, but I was putting them kind of in a, um, what I thought was an easy way to, to read them. And this was the first time they kind of all came together. And it was like, wow, that's, that was interesting. Well, it was really beyond interesting because I, I just, it surprised me. And I think you know, if you can be surprised by your own work, I think that's <laughs> that's kind of telling. But but anyway, um, I uh, uh, I hope I answered that. Absolutely. So, Amanda, um, someone says your work is amazing. They say the traditional way of making ceramics is so extensive and really beautiful. Is there a specific place where you like to mine your clay or are there different locations that mm -hmm. offer different elements for each project? Uh, no, there's only one where we get the clay um, and that's from there. Uh, my mom, she, we do have a studio. And actually I did grow up at Acoma, right below the Mesa. That's been my family home since I was born. So I was, you know, I grew up there. I've actually only been living in the city for about a year now. I did move due to work, of course. Uh, but where I live, if, if you've ever been to Akuma, it's in the middle of nowhere, literally. I have two neighbors. One of them is my cousin, you know. And, I mean, it's a real secluded area and there's rocks everywhere. My daughter loves to climb and sometimes when I get stressed out with my painting, especially if I'm getting ready for a show, you know, I will go for a walk or I will sit on the rocks or something. And, but it's, it's really quiet there, you know, so it, it's a good place to focus and do your work. Yeah. A group of us faculty actually went to Acoma and I can attest that it's, it's beautiful, it's quiet, it's, it was yeah. really a magical place. Yeah, so yeah, like, like that's where I, like I said, I've grown up there my whole life. So I miss it, you know, I miss being in a quiet area, you know, of course the city is really loud. <laughs> so it, it's a change, but um, I do go home as often as I can. Um, it, it's been rough because of the COVID situation. Um, they're not allowing the children off the Pueblo. So I haven't seen my daughter in almost a year because of it. And it's hard. <laughs> it really is. 
the only time I was allowed to go home was actually for her birthday last month. I had to get a COVID test, get a clearance, get a pass. And I was only allowed on the Pueblo until seven o'clock that day. So I had to leave at seven and it, it's rough. <laughs> but, you know, getting through it. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, Joe, I have another question for you. Um, when do you know when a piece is finished? I mean, this, this would probably relate to just painting or, or, or one of the sculptures. Yeah. I think painting is easier. Um, I um, sculpture is harder for me uh, because it. Uh, I don't know. I think it's the thing about walking around it and you know just seeing things that you know painting is you know painting's two D, and I think the three D uh, and 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 I think the same goes with ceramics too because. It's just a sense that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not a perfectionist or anything even close to that, but there are things that bug me. And I, do, I you know it's, it kind of fits in my own vocabulary. And, uh, it's, it's probably something that just bugs me, but you know, nobody else. But, but I, do think, I do think that sculpture is harder, but there is a point with all things. It's like, it's got to be done. I mean, it's, 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 even with all of its flaws or whatever you perceive them to be, um, you know, you have to kind of send it out. How, how many of the frags are you working on at a time? I mean, you showed the picture of your students. A lot. All the frags. Yeah. So a is, lot. Yeah. is there a, a process of stepping away from one and moving to another one to help kind of, you know, define the conversation? And again, this is going to get kind of, you know, hippy dippy kind of stuff, but I kind of go into this place. I mean, I, I didn't do this for years, but lately I've been wearing headphones. And of course, when it gets my, oh, and my studio is outdoors. So I, 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 you know, Fred said, you need a fan out there. You were going to fake. And it's like, I kind of like that. And so I kind of go there and, um, but I'm not real, um, you know, I'm not really concerned about all of that. It's sort of like after a day, I may, I may have a couple of things that I'm kind of happy about. And um, some days I have lots of things I'm happy about, but then I'll come back the next day and it's like, I'm not happy about those anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but one thing I have to say that has happened in my life, uh, because I always worked a full-time job as we often artists have to do. And um, I could come back, you know, I can work anytime I want. I mean, as long as I want, as much as I want. I've always been a pretty good, my, my work ethic's pretty good. But lately, I mean, since, I, since Fred and I both are retired, I mean, it's, it's amazing the kind of work that we can churn out. And, uh, and I'm not saying all of it's good, but it's just keeping that energy going. And, that's what feeds the next day, sometimes, most times. There was a question earlier, I think it was directed towards Amanda, but I, I was going to maybe throw it at both, at both of you, is, is, is how do you balance uh, your time? How do you balance, I mean, you think you just kind of answered this a little bit, but, but Amanda, how do you balance your uh, studio practice with, with your everyday uh, well, chores or duties or, or you know, life? Uh... It's rough, um, you know, uh, like right now I want to paint, but this is the only time I have with my daughter, you know, they're getting ready to head home, so I won't see her for who knows how long. But um, actually I just try to paint when my daughter's asleep, which is late at night, <laughs> usually around nine, 10 o'clock, I'm sitting there with a light bulb beaming down on me so I can paint or I get up around five, four or five in the morning to try to paint a, a bit before I do go to work. Um, right now I am working from home. So that is a little bit of a pro for me because I can actually, you know, when I'm on my lunch break, grab my pottery and paint a little bit or mix my paint or process my clay, whatever I need to do. But it, it, is, it does get tiresome, and especially the, when I'm getting ready for a show. That's when I'm like, really sitting there night and day, burning out lamp oil, trying to get the pieces made. <laughs> so 
but yeah, it, it works out somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Joe, Joe, what's your, what's your work schedule like? I mean, do you, do you make it a point that you spend so many hours in the studio? Is it, is it a, like a, you still create like a, like a day job that you just go to every day? Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and for, and you know, now that I have this added, but well, Fred and I spent our, our time uh, redoing our studio. So, um, and then I, I put an outdoor portion to to mine, and uh, I think it was part, probably something we were both supposed to share. But I got very greedy, and um, but uh, but in the summer, well, spring, summer, and then fall. Uh, uh, and I know this sounds kind of crazy, but I I sort of have these projects that I'm thinking about during the winter, and so I. Um, last well, last uh, uh, summer, I had a. Uh, uh, I like to work in oil, and it's not all environments are not conducive to that. And even though I'm pretty eco friendly with the stuff, I uh, I still don't want to breathe that in. So I work outside with that, and so I was working for a good portion of the summer just making these small. Uh, oil paintings that, you know, where did that come from? I, I, I really don't know, but it was really intriguing to me. And I uh, ended up filling all these books with, with all of those, those, uh, those paintings that I haven't, I have no idea what I'm going to do with them. And that's the thing. When I work, I don't think about shows or, you know, what, what that's, what, what I'm going to do with that uh, other than have it. And, um, I guess I'm kind of a hoarder. Like I'm, I'm an art hoarder is what I am. <laughs> Excellent. 